Welcome to our fourth module dedicated to the dihedral subgroup problem. In this lecture, we discuss the dihedral group. So we will give several definitions of the dihedral group. First off, a, an abstract definition where we define it simply by the relationships between two of its generators. So we say that this is a group generated by R and S that satisfy R square equals one, S to the N equals one. So we say R and S have order respectively two and N in this group, and such that they satisfy this relationship uh, between each other. So what we claim here is that the elements of D sub N are the identity, of course, and then S, S square until s to the n minus 1. And remember, if I continue to raise to more powers of s, then I would just loop back. And then r times s, r times s square, and so on, until r times s to the n minus 1. So these are 2n elements. And what we claim is, these are the only elements that we have uh, uh, in D sub n, okay? So, uh, let's give an example of a multiplication of two elements of this form. So, what I need, of course, is land back on the same, uh, on an element of the form R or nothing times S to a certain power between uh, 0 and n minus 1, okay? Now, remember, S and R are given by this relationship, we immediately see that S times R times S is equal to R inverse, which of course is equal to R. And let's just leverage that one relation to simplify the expression R S cubed times R S squared, okay? So by associativity, I can reorder uh, those multiplications in the Dahil group. So in particular, what I have here is R S squared times S times R times S times S, okay? So this, I just said, was equal to R, okay? Uh, now, I can further simplify by saying that this is R times S times S R S, okay? And S, R, S is again R. And so what I have here is R, S, uh, S, R, okay? And R, S, R, I said was S inverse, okay? So that's because we have still this. And S inverse, because the order of S is N, S to the N is one, I mean E, the, the neutral element. So S inverse is S to the n minus 1, and this is one of the elements of the form uh, s to the i that we just described, okay? So this gives you an example of how we can uh, perform arithmetic operations just by looking at the relationships between the elements of the n. Now, there is a more constructive way, of course, to describe uh, the dihedral group. Uh, here we'll, we'll, we'll use a semi-direct product. Okay, so we'll have to define a little bit very quickly what a semi-direct product is, but it's really a way to describe dn as z mod nz times z mod 2z with a very special way to add up uh, elements that is not the usual way we know when we take two groups and we take the Cartesian product. One way to turn this into a group, of course, is to have uh, addition uh, on the elements component-wise. Here, we're not going to do exactly a component-wise addition, and that's what the, makes the dihedral group different than z mod n z times z mod 2z. So, we say that dn is the semi-direct product, which is parametrized by this function. So, this function is a function on z mod 2z, where, of course, uh, the only possibility being, uh, so it's a function that, that maps function that maps elements of, on z mod n z, and that function phi of, phi of zero is the identity function, 
why 5, 1 is the inversion on z mod n z. Okay, so every phi of i is a map from z mod n z to z mod n z. Okay, and so what it means here, put simply, uh, we look at elements of dn as, like I said, the Cartesian product of z mod n z by z mod 2z, and then we define this operation between elements by a, so the second coordinate is just an addition in z mod 2z, okay, so there's really nothing uh, uh, going on here, but here, instead of always having an addition, sometimes we have an addition by the inverse, okay, so this is really, uh, this is really a plus phi of b applied to a prime, okay, but really, the way this translates, how this translates is to say that this is going to be a plus minus one to the b. So when b equals one, we really are doing a plus a prime. So we're really just doing addition coordinate wise. But if b equals one, then what we're doing is a subtraction instead of the addition on the first components. Okay. So here's an example of what the arithmetic operations look like. So first off, when the second coordinate here is a zero, then really we're seeing no difference than uh, the uh, uh, than when we're looking at uh, the simple group, uh, the, the group induced by the addition on uh, coordinate wise. Okay, so this here we have uh, two plus four each, each time. Of course. What happens on the second coordinate is always the addition of the two coordinates. And here we see that when we have one, then what we have here is a minus between the two components. Now, of course, one thing that we might want to uh, pay attention to is how to invert an element A, B. Okay, so the inverse has a, a funny shape. And the reason, of course, is that it's not minus A minus B. The same way it would be if we were looking at uh, the sort of natural uh, uh, group law on z mod n z times z mod 2z. So let's just see why this is the case. So let's say I do uh, a b times minus 1 minus minus 1 to the b times a. What do I have here? I have a uh, minus. So um, a minus um, uh, one. So here we got this, and then this times a, and then b plus b. And of course, this is one. And so we have a minus a, and b plus b, and b plus b because this is f two. I mean z mod 2z, then what we get is 0 and then 0 as well, okay? So we have, and of course this is the neutral element of, our, of d sub n, okay? So we have arithmetic operations that are very easy uh, to, to perform given that explicit uh, description is quite easier than what we had only when we were looking at um, uh, the relationships abstractly. Now, there is a sort of a last way to interpret d sub n that I wanted to uh, touch on in this lecture is the sort of visual interpretation of the elements of d sub n. So dn can be viewed as a group of, of rotations and reflections, okay, and how you can compose them on a, a picture. So for example, here we have this picture of an F taken from the Wikipedia page of uh, the dihedral group. And uh, what do we have is we gonna, we're going to identify the element of order N with clockwise rotations of our image of an angle uh, uh, 2 pi over, uh, over N. And we're gonna identify the elements of order two with a reflection, okay? And so what we see here is for D4, so what we have is, for example, here we have 
the action. So one rotation, two rotation, three rotation, and then the fourth rotation leaves you uh, uh, back to uh, your original um, uh, your original figure. And then here is our reflection here. So we turn around. Uh, let's see if, if this is the x axis. So we turn around this axis, and and uh, this is uh, that action. And then if you if you uh, compose it with a, uh, so with the element of order n with the clockwise rotation, then what you get here is so what you get here, for example, is what, what happens if you rotate and then reflect. Okay. So, and one thing that is very important is that we are not looking at a commutative group. So how does that translate visually? It means that if you, so here it's you rotate, then reflect, is not the same thing as reflect and rotate, okay? So rotate and reflect is this element, okay? So um, we have, uh, so we have our, uh, sorry, rotate, yeah, rotate and reflect is this element, but now reflect and rotate is this element, okay? So these are two different elements. So, uh, so this is an example of a non-commutative group, and that has uh, uh, severe consequences when it comes to uh, looking at the hidden subgroup problem in this non-commutative group. There is a, a theory of, of hidden subgroup problem, how to solve them efficiently uh, on, on commutative groups, especially finite commutative groups. And, and Shor's algorithm is sort of the sort of prototype of it, uh, working on, on a specific example. But here, when we're dealing with non-commutative groups, we have ad hoc methods. Sometimes they're efficient and sometimes they're not. Here, we're going we're gonna to see uh, in the next lecture a method that is sort of somewhat efficient, which means it's going to be not as good as what we know how to do in, in commutative groups, uh, but still better than in general. So the hidden subgroup problem, first we want to reduce it to a simple case. So we want to uh, reduce the hidden subgroup problem in Dn, the dihedral group, to a case where the hidden subgroup H has a very simple shape. So what we do first is we define a subgroup, which is also something is, which is unknown to us, uh, H1, which is the intersection of our hidden subgroup with the elements of the form A0, okay? So the, num the elements of the form A0, they will form a subgroup of H, okay? And that's really what's important. That subgroup of H, you can, you can quotient. So that subgroup H1 is a subgroup of Dn, and you can quotient it and prove that in fact it's isomorphic to another uh, dihedral group, that one with a smaller modulus m, so m dividing n. Okay, and the shape of the hidden subgroup here is just a quotient of h by h1. Now, if f hides h, so we, we, we have the function here that is co uh, co constant on all the cosets of h, uh, and, and different on different cosets, okay? And now we have, we can have easily uh, uh, a function f prime that, that derives directly from f that hides h1, okay? And that is by simply defining uh, f prime by f of x, but simply on, on this uh, restricted uh, uh, group here, so a subgroup of dn, okay? So, uh, this is a, uh, a way that we can uh, find uh, sub, the subgroup H1. The reason is because this is essentially a uh, Z mod, so it's a quotient of Z mod and Z. So what it means is we're looking at a finite commutative group and we can find H1 simply with Shor's algorithm or, I mean, uh, a hidden subgroup problem in, in Z mod NZ. So what is the strategy here? We have a way to hide H1 
in a subgroup of Dn, which is essentially a subgroup of Z mod Nz. Okay, so in this in subgroups of Z mod Nz, we know how to solve the hidden subgroup problem much more easily than in the dihedral subgroup in the dihedral group. Sorry. And the reason is, from what I said in the previous slide, is because we're dealing with a finite commutative group and the, there are efficient methods, something that it runs in polynomial time. So we may as well do it, right? We have the function that hides it. We can evaluate it because we know how to intersect dn with uh, z mod n z times zero. And so we do it. And once we do it, it gives us a subgroup H1. Then we're going to use that subgroup H1 to create a second instance of our dihedral uh, subgroup problem that's going to be this time in this DM. And we're going to say that we're going to be able to prove that the subgroup that is being hidden, which is H2, we've already uh, shown it's H quotient by H1, this subgroup will have a very special shape. So we're looking at H2 here that is inside of dm. So first off, who hides? So what function hides that subgroup? Remember, you, you, your hidden subgroup problem is only uh, defined if you have access to a function that, that is constant on the cosets and, and a different on different cosets. So here, our function is defined. So this, remember, is dn, OK? So we have equality here, but it's easier to because we have access to dn and we have access to h1. And so we can say that a, an element x, which we can rephrase as a uh, coset uh, modulo h1, we say it's um, f evaluates as f uh, the uh, function originally, the original function of our original uh, hidden subgroup problem evaluated on, on a representative of, of this coset. So one, the first thing we need, to, we need to check, of course, is if that f second, so that function f on dm is well defined. So what it means is if you have that x equals both uh, g times h1, but also g prime times h1, okay, do we have that f of g equals f of g prime? Okay, because otherwise f would not be well defined. It would depend on the specific representative g of the coset x that we choose to define its evaluation. So of course, what we require here is that both g and g prime are evaluated the same element through f. So why is this true? Well, what we have is of course, because g times g inverse, g prime inverse is in h1, it's also in h. So what we have is that gh equals g prime of h. And so because f is constant on the coset of h, what we have is f of x equals, sorry, f of g equals f of g prime. And so f of x, sorry, f second of x is well defined. Okay, so that is the first thing that we need to check, and this works. Now, the thing that we're going to claim is that H2 can have only the two very simple forms where it's either the trivial group, so it contains only the neutral element, which is as small a subgroup as it gets, okay, uh, short of being empty and therefore not a subgroup, or it has two elements, two only, where uh, one is, of course, the, the, the neutral element, and the other one is an element of the form k1, okay, for some k less than m. So these are very special cases, okay, and what we want to prove here, of course, is that it is true that these are only the two possibilities. So first of all, let's prove that H2 cannot contain elements of the form uh, uh, so let's say uh, H contains an element of the form K prime zero. Okay, well, K prime zero, an element of this form is in H1. Okay, but we said that H2 was H quotient by H1. Okay, so this thing, this element K prime zero, 
is in the same coset as 0, 0 uh, in H1, module H1. So what it means is you can identify these in H2. So in H2, what we have is, of course, K prime 0. So we have k prime 0 h1, this is equal to k prime, sorry, to 0, 0 h1, okay? So this is due to the fact that h2, the elements of h2 really are cosets modulo h1, okay? So this element k prime 0 is really identified with the cosets of that element modulo h1, okay? Turns out these are as cosets, so uh, uh, H k prime 0 times h1 is the same as 0, 0 times h1 because these two are in the same coset mod h2, okay? I'm sorry, mod h1. And so because this is the case, then you can identify them. They're in fact two, uh, they're in fact the same element. So 0, 0 is the same as k prime 0 for every possible k prime, okay? So we've ruled out the existence of any element like that in, in, in H2 that is not k prime equals zero, okay? Now the question is, what if we had a k prime one and a k one in H1? And so what would happen then? Well, what we would have certainly is that k one times so if those two, so if those two are in H2, what happens? So because H2 is a subgroup, then K prime one times, I mean K1 times K prime one, which is equal to K minus K prime zero, this must be in H2, okay? And that's because H2 as a subgroup must be stable by multiplication. But if it's in H2, the product, if it's of the form of this form, then it must be also equal to zero. And so what it means is that K has to be equal to K prime. Therefore, there really is only room for one element of this form in the subgroup that we're looking for, okay? So really here, what it means is we have found a way to efficiently reduce our generic hidden subgroup problem in DN into a very not generic hidden subgroup problem in another, so in a D sub M, okay, so another dihedral group, a little bit smaller, but it doesn't really matter how much smaller. What's really important here is that the dihedral subgroup problem became of a very special shape, and that's the shape that we will focus on in the next lecture, where we describe a sieve procedure to find the hidden subgroup, to find the hidden subgroup H2. Okay, so that H2 really, the, the, the finding of the H2 really means that we're looking for one element, the one that is non-zero. Okay, I mean, the not the neutral element. So we have only one element to find, and that really simplifies the hidden subgroup problem a lot. Okay, so now before we finish this lecture, we will see one last thing, which is the connection with the hidden shift problem, okay? So we assume that we have two functions. What we want to see is here another problem that is sort of somewhat connected to uh, very interesting problems in cryptography. And, and this relates to the hidden subgroup problem in the dihedral group. So assume that we have two functions, call them F0 and F1, from Z at mod NZ to X. Okay, and assume in addition that one is equal to the other one uh, plus a shift. Okay, so what it means is, for example, uh, without loss of generality, uh, F1 of X is F0 of X plus S. And the problem of the hidden shift problem, uh, I mean, the problem we're trying to solve here is finding the shift S. So we assume nobody's telling you who is S, the only thing you know is you know how to evaluate F0 and F1, okay? So you're given boxes, 
if you ask the first box, it gives you uh, evaluations of F0, and the other box will give you evaluations of F1, okay? You know somehow that the outputs are connected in this way, that, you know, the, the F1 of X is always F0 of, of X plus S, but you don't know S. The question is, how many evaluations of that function would you need in order, I mean, of those two functions, um, uh, how many of these evaluations would you need in order to uh, find the secret shift? Now here, what we're gonna say, what we're gonna show is that in fact, it can be entirely reduced to finding a, uh, to solving the hidden subgroup problem for a particular subgroup, okay? So let's see what kind of function we would use to define the hidden subgroup problem. So here we make the assumption in, on top of that, that F0 and F1 are injective, okay? So uh, this will be uh, required to uh, reduce this to the hidden shift problem, to the, to the hidden subgroup problem. So we define an F that is, uh, that takes value in D sub N by uh, F of A, B is F sub B of A, okay? So remember B is here, zero or one, okay? So it evaluates either F zero, F one on A depending on the value of B, okay? Which is zero, one. So the question here is, uh, is F constant on the cosets of a particular H, okay? So does it hide as a hidden subgroup? Uh, and then it, the answer is yes, as we will see in the next slide, uh, but really, here, I just want to show you the result in advance. This is the, um, uh, the, the subgroup that is being hidden by this function, okay? So you see two elements is, is of course, very convenient. So it falls into the, fall the previous framework. And then the second element, if you knew it, would give you readily the uh, hidden shift S, okay? So you would know the second element I mean, from the second element, you solve your hidden shift problem, okay? So somebody gives you H means you solve the hidden shift problem for that F0 and F1. So the question now is, why is this true that we have, uh, that uh, the function F we just defined hides this particular and very convenient subgroup H? So what we must show is that F of a, B is equal to F of A prime, B prime, if and only if A prime, B prime, and A, B are in the same coset, which can be rephrased as saying that A prime, B prime is in the coset of A, B, okay? These are two uh, exact same things. So that is the same thing as saying that A prime, B prime times H is equal to A, B times H, okay? But that formulation that I just circled is very important. And the reason why is because I'm going to be able to, um, to show that this is obvious from the arithmetic in D sub n. So remember, because of the laws that we, that we uh, you know, from the definition of D sub n as a semi-direct product, we have that a, b times the, remember h has two elements, so a, B times zero is obviously A, B, and A, B times the other element of H minus S one is equal to uh, A minus minus one to the B times S, B plus one. Okay, so there are really two possible elements in A, B, H, okay? So A, B times H contains this element here or just a, B, because that would be A, B times the neutral element. So there's really two different possibilities for A prime, B prime to be in A, B times H. So let's show what happens in one direction, okay? So assuming here that A prime, B prime is in the coset we just said, A, B times H. So one of the possibilities, and we can uh, we can get that out of the way really quick here, is if A prime B prime equals AB, then obviously 
we will have that f of a prime b prime is equal to f of a b, okay? So now, how can we argue that f of a prime b prime is equal to f of a b when we have on the other hand, the other possibility, which is, I'm going to write it down here, that a prime b prime equals a minus minus 1 to the b times s and b plus 1, okay? So, if b prime equals 0, let's just, no, sorry, if, let's say b equals 0 here. So, b equals 0 will mean, of course, that if b prime equals 1, and that's because this is b prime, and since b equals 0, then what we have is uh, a prime, so we have a prime b prime equals, so a plus, so sorry, minus, minus 1 to the 0, so minus s b, okay? And this is 1, and this is 0. So f of a prime b prime here is going to be f1 of a prime, okay? On the other hand, f of a b, so f1 of a prime, sorry, and I forgot to say that is going to be f1 of a minus s, okay? Which equals f0 of a minus s plus s, which is f0 of a. On the other hand, f of a b will equal uh, f, so here we have b equals 0, so that f of f0 of a, and these two values are equal, okay? And then in the case where b equals 1, and of course, consequently, b prime equals 0, we end up with the exact same situation in reverse. So I'm going to skip the details here, but we would prove the same thing, which is that the, uh, we have necessarily f of a prime b prime equals f of a b. Now, of course, there's another direction then to deal with is that if f are equal, so if f evaluates a, a b and a prime b prime to the same element, then we would have to argue that uh, we have a b and a prime b prime in the same coset modulo h. But we follow that exact same pattern here. So um, in the end, what we have proven is that we are capable of reducing um, uh, the hidden shift problem to an instance of the hidden subgroup problem in the particular shape that we're interested in. Now, in the next lecture, we will see how to solve that hidden subgroup problem in DN for those very specific shapes of subgroup H of the form two elements where one is the neutral element and the other one is K1. Thank you for your attention.